Welcome to the Heart Health Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Menelisino, Medical Director for the Menno Clinic Center for Functional Medicine in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. This is your chance to listen to international experts to learn how to achieve optimum vitality for health and to prevent heart disease. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by one of my good friends, Dr. Michelle Jeffries. Thank you. Nice to be here. I've known Michelle for a long time. She's one of the people I respect. She's actually consulting on a family member for me. That's how much I trust her. And I think you'll love what you're going to hear today about how she approaches not just the skin health, but the overall person. So, Michelle, let me tell our viewers a little bit about you. Okay. Dr. Michelle Jeffries is an integrative dermatologist in private practice in Phoenix, Arizona. She is triple board certified in osteopathic medicine, in dermatology, pediatric dermatology, and integrative medicine. Dr. Jeffries also has a master's degree in psychology and is certified through the Institute for Functional Medicine as a certified functional medicine practitioner. Her training and background has led her to a unique, individualized, holistic approach to skin health that really blends the mind, the body, and the spirit with skin care. So we're going to talk today about how to put all of those together. And, and Michelle, you're really one of those unique physicians that has a little bit of everything in one good spot. Oh, thank you. Yes, it's been a journey to get here. It's, it's been a beautiful journey. We have a lot of our friends that, that have come to Integrative and Functional Medicine. They seem to come here from a story. Per, perhaps it's their own health, the health of a loved one or for some other reason why they got attracted to this kind of medicine. Do you have a story like that too? I do, I do. Um, and, no, not at all. Um, and you know, and it's, it's definitely more of a personal health journey. My, my interest in medicine started when I was really little. I, I just used to love looking at um, anatomy books and different things, even to the point where I would sit and watch cartoons. And this, I might be dating myself, but it's when we had the big console TVs and I would turn the TV so it'd be by the stairs next to our bookshelf so I could get that encyclopedia and then just page through the pages of the human anatomy. And I just thought for sure I was going to learn how all that worked. And that's what I was going to do with my life. And this is before I was eight years old. So my journey to medicine definitely started very early. And, you know, as the journey unfolded, I thought for sure I'd go to medical school and do all those things. And um, I got to the point of where I was going to college and actually... Um, sadly enough, my high school sweetheart passed away suddenly, and my grandmother passed away suddenly from breast cancer. Um, and so I totally changed gears. I decided medicine may not be for me. I don't think I can handle life and death. Um, I, I, I need to help people in some way, you know, but I took a different path. So I went to psychology, so that's where my psychology degree um, came up. And I just couldn't resist um, sitting in anatomy physiology classes in grad school in psychology in my spare time. So kind of nerdy, but couldn't resist it. So I ended up going to med school. Um, and then when I finished all of my training in medicine, I ran into some health problems. I was young. Um, mm. I had a, a stress fracture that they couldn't explain. I was exhausted all the time. I had skin rashes. Um, and so I started looking outside of all of my traditional training. I felt very unprepared and even in healing myself. So I kind of took a mind, body, spirit approach and I stumbled into Dr. Andrew Wiles program in integrative medicine. And then I came across the Institute for Functional Medicine in my first year of training of that. So it just, it's been a beautiful journey. I'm grateful for every moment. And now I'm able to blend all of those things. I, I would have never pieced it all together that I'd be able to do it all and put it all together to help people. But. Well, you know, I really admire that uh, you sparked the own personal interest, but that you did the work to get the knowledge and training that you did. That's a lot of commitment by a doctor to take on Dr. Weil's formal integrative training and to continue pursuing that. Well, what's motivating you now on a day-to-day -day basis to learn more, to, to be so excited about what you do? You know, I think that thirst for knowledge started, it just be, must be a part of me because I was so nerdy, like, you know, even when I was young, looking at things. But I think just the natural unfolding of finding new layers and new ways to treat people, new ways to blend things, things that, um, you know, benefit as far as, you know, prescriptions and traditional medicine and our technology of imaging that we have and, and different ways to put that together. But also all of the ancient knowledge we have of all of the different supplements and how everything's connected in the body and the mind and the spirit. And 
herbal supplements and nutrition and how to blend all of that together. Um, it's incredibly exciting. There's so much to learn and so much to put together. And I think, you know, you and I are just on the, on the cusp too of learning and, and a constant thriving to learn. But when you get that patient that you're able to help and you're able to really resonate with where they're at and bring them along a healing journey like you have done and being able to do it in a medically sound way, it's, it's just so rewarding and there's nothing else like it. I'm, I'm sure you can relate. <laughs> well, I think we're both fortunate that we did the medical doctor training and that really gives us mm -hmm. such a solid foundation. I'll be honest with you, uh, Michelle, that dermatology is one of the hardest specialties for me. I'm an internist, so we're supposed to know a little bit about everything. And both of my brothers are internists also. And we were joking the other day, talking together, <laughs> how when people come in with these weird things on their skin and everybody has skin issues at some point in their life, yes. it's going to be the number one health issue you have. And for most doctors, it's such a black box. It's so complicated. I know you don't think about the lotions and potions and just putting on steroid cream that most doctors do. When a woman comes to you with say acne and she's, she's younger or older, what's the starting point that you're going to look at for her? You know, the starting point is really getting to know them, where, where they've been, what they've tried, um, what they're interested in. Are, are they on a journey themselves of health and, and wellness? Um, are they even having awareness that nutrition might be a factor and hormones and stress and, and all of those? And so it's starting with getting to know who they are mm -hmm. and then how could I guide them along their journey um, and so it's asking a lot of questions of, you know, what have you tried? Where are you at? And, and going from there. So I, I get a big variety of answers there for sure. <laughs> well, in medical school, they taught us to give a pill for the ill and that yeah. everything you're just kind of putting a bandaid on. Whereas I know you dig deep and really look for root cause problems for the skin. It's a lot of work. Uh, for someone. And uh, a lot of times we just want to put a lotion on, or, on it or take a pill for it. And, what are some of the things that you really help be, that helps you to get people to be motivated and to to do the the heavy lifting of the journey of optimal skin? You know, I think when you have something on your skin that everybody can see, it's motivation in itself because there's such a self-esteem um, component to sure. it. When you have a huge pimple on your forehead or your nose or you have, you know, a rash on your face or you go to shake somebody's hand and your hands are peely and dry, um, it, it makes it my job very easy because they don't want to have the imperfection or have that. And so when they're able to see when they make that journey of, you know, making nutrition changes or doing supplements or managing their stress, and we actually are able to make an impact, um, then they're all in. And so it's, it's showing them that there's a lot of things we can do. We can add a pill, we can add a cream, we can do all of that too, but let's kind of do some inner healing too, so that we don't have to always rely on the cream or the pill. So, you know, it's, it's, I have it a little easy where, you know, the illness you can see, you know, when they walk in the door where, you know, with heart disease and things like that, you can't see it. You don't even know it's silent. Um, and so I, I have a great motivating factor in my patients where they just don't want to look the where they're looking and have the imperfection as they view it. Um, and so it makes my job really easy. And usually they don't come and see me if they're not motivated. They're not going to waste their copay on their insurance or, you know, they might, it might be out of pocket because they have a deductible. They might just pay, pay in cash. And so, so there's definitely that. So, um, you know, I, have it, I have it a little easy because of the skin. You can see it. <laughs> well, we had, were talking with uh, Dr. Alejandro Junger the other day, and yeah. he made a great analogy that, that the outside, the skin, if it had all these holes and was permeable, we'd have all these scars and all these scabs and all these open wounds, and that our gut is essentially the skin turned inside out. Absolutely. And yes. when it's stressed and becomes permeable, it's like as if the skin were to have all those holes in it. Our gut does, and it lets all those inflammatory reactions happen. How do you think about the gut and the skin and what's their relationship? You know, I'm so glad you asked because when I was in my integrative medicine training, I was invited to go to the first um, functional medicine meeting. And um, it's a five day um, event and I was thinking, oh, I don't have time for this. I'm doing so many things. But I did, and I was kind of skeptical. I'm like, I'm hearing this stuff about leaky gut and all this stuff. I'm like, I don't know if it's real. I'm like, you know, I'm already alternative enough. Like, what, how would, what more could I, you know, you know, do? And literally, I was sitting in one of the lectures, and they were talking about leaky gut and, and how it works. 
And the analogy of how the gut cells stick together and how the immune system plays a role um, and then when they're separated, how the immune system comes in and then there's leakage of material that comes out and reactions to that. It literally, it's just like leaky skin, which is yes. like eczema and psoriasis and all of those. And literally it's the same immune factors that are coming in. So I could have easily sat there and replaced everything with the gut with skin and it would have been the same lecture. And wow. that's when all my light bulbs went off. So <laughs> that's exactly the moment wow. where I was sold on functional medicine. So it's basically what you said. It's, it's a matter of um, everything's related and coordinated and our body is one, one big coordinating system. And even though in traditional medicine, we're trained that the heart is separate from the gut, is separate from the brain, separate from the skin, there's a lot of evidence now that everything's kind of integrated together and related. So um, it's a beautiful thing and it gives us a lot of points of where we can intervene and do things and heal things in one area and also others, which is pretty cool. You know, you mentioned psoriasis and uh, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the treatments I remember in medical school was putting coal tar on it mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. it was UV, uh, ultraviolet light and now we're using drugs which are immune mm -hmm. modifiers, monoclonal antibody inhibitors. And I am not anti-drug. I'm appropriate use at appropriate times. But it sounds like you have so many more tools and so many more strategies to go through before you would turn to a drug like that. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. So especially with psoriasis, um, when you have skin psoriasis, you're actually at higher risk for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease. Yes. Um, and what's really interesting in dermatology, we used to think that some of the interventions we were doing were not related to that and it was just incidental. And now within the past several years, there is so much data just even showing that even some of our um, medications that we use actually are impacting heart because we're, we're realizing heart's more of an inflammatory condition. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of things you can get at with nutrition um, in psoriasis and stopping the inflammation from the inside out and supplements like turmeric, um, other anti-inflammatory things, um, you know, like CBD and low dose naltrexone and, you know, a lot of other things you can do from the inside out and outside in of calming down inflammation. Um, and a lot of the drunk companies now that are promoting some of the biologics and things like that, they're, um, their kind of selling point is that psoriasis isn't just in the skin, yes. that it's more than that. And so it's just kind of interesting to me that they're, they're viewing it as a new concept where I'm like, this has always been this way. <laughs> it's not new. And, you know, I'd much rather use, you know, nutrition and supplements to heal from the inside out and, and impact them um, and, and show them new patterns rather than taking a medication that's going to suppress them. But when needed, when needed, we do. So absolutely. Well, I love your whole person, whole universe view of health because it's really all tied together. You mentioned the cholesterol and heart disease. There's 10 times more risk of heart disease in people with autoimmune disease like psoriasis. And the latest cholesterol drug is actually the same mechanism, this monoclonal antibody inhibitor that they're using at high levels for psoriasis. Oh, so it's, wow. it's, it's approximately $30,000 a year versus 1200 but uh, they're yeah. understanding this inflammatory process. I know one of your personal passions is skin cancer prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in Phoenix. I'm in Jackson Hole. We both have incredibly high rates of skin cancer because of the intensity of the sun and the outdoor lifestyle that everyone shares there. How are, how are you teaching your clients to reduce their individual risk? Who are the canaries in the coal mines? What nutritionally can we do to support the skin health? And, and how do you approach that prevention of skin cancer? Yeah, so here in um, Phoenix, Arizona, we have so much sunshine all the time. And so um, getting enough sun exposure is not the issue here, where some of you listening, it might be you know, a huge issue where you're not even getting enough. So um, certainly I, I deal with a you know, patient population that's, that's out golfing all the time and out at the pool and everything. So um, I'm definitely not one of those dermatologists that's going to promote you living indoors all the time, covering yourself all the time, and living like a vampire. Um, and so there's definitely a balance to getting a little bit of some sun exposure. You do need nature. 
um, you know, to heal your inner mind, body, and spirit, yes. um, connecting with that too. So I definitely don't feel like you, you have to compromise or take away all of those things a hundred percent. You can be outside, but one of the things you want to do, you just want to be smart about what you're doing. You want to recognize that the sun can damage your skin. It can age your skin. It's, it's not always entirely healthy and it, it can be in moderation, you know, not excessive amounts. And then if you are going to be out there a long time, I mean, we have beautiful mountains here and so do you, especially your background, um, to go hiking and, and do different things. And the main foundation of protecting your skin would be with clothing, um, wearing a big wide brim hat, you know, sunglasses to protect your eyes, long sleeves, long pants. And my patients, when it's 100 degrees here, laugh at me. But literally, you're going to be hot even if you're hiking in a bathing suit. You're still going to be hot. You know, covering your, yourself with clothing is the best. It's, you don't have to worry about chemicals in a sunscreen. You don't have to worry about all those things. You can cover yourself with protective clothing. So that's number one. Um, number two would be sunscreen and using more of the zinc oxide-based natural sunscreens, ideally, and then reapplying every couple hours because it does break down. Um, and then also you can definitely from the inside out, you know, eat healthy, make sure you're getting those phytonutrients from every single color of every fruit and vegetable every day to get all those phytonutrients. There's also some supplements that um, have been researched to help. Um, one of them is called HelioCare, which is a derivative of a fern plant that gives you an internal antioxidant. Um, niacinamide is a B vitamin that's also been researched. It won't, you know, none of these will prevent skin cancer, but they'll help protect you um, a little bit more. Um, and then the other caveat to it is that um, skin cancer is not all sun exposure. It's one thing that we can modify. It's one thing that we know is a big trigger, but it's not all of the story. Um, I can't tell you how many patients I see that have skin cancer in areas where they don't get a lot of sun and mm -hmm. areas where they do protect with clothing. So the part about nutrition and eating healthy and how are you feeling, fueling those cells um, and are you giving yourselves the right resources if they make a mistake when you get a new skin layer in, can they correct it? Because it happens a lot. Um, and so that's where the nutrition and supplements come in and you know, and stress too, stress management, people that are under chronic stress, their body is not focused on their skin, it's focused on other things. So we can definitely dive deep into any one of those if you like, but well, that's the quick great. version. <laughs> well, that was all great. And it's, it's really this whole body approach that you keep coming back to that I love so much about how you practice. And it's, it's an integrated model. It's a whole person approach. Are there some kind of food rules that, that uh, Dr. Jeffries follows when you talk about what are some of the things that you eat? besides the color foods or anything particularly that can really be skin supportive and skin protective? Right. So, I mean, number one for me is absolutely the rainbow of fruits and vegetables every single day. I mean, that, um, you know, above and beyond anything else, making sure you eat something red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, Every day. Yes, I said every day. <laughs> Are you able um, to do that yourself? Yes. So I yeah, make a I'm rainbow too. salad is what I call it. And just when I go to the store once a week, I go and I look at the produce and I, you know, I go to the organic aisle and then I just pick, you know, sometimes it's the carrots that have the multiple colors and the radishes that have multiple colors and peppers and it depends on what's in season. Um, but you certainly also can take a multivitamin in the supplement and things like that too. Um, but I, I, love your, I love your idea, Michelle, if I may interrupt you. Yeah. Michelle, I love your idea. What you're really talking about is these multiple colors. And mm -hmm. I do the same thing you do. If you go to the store once a week to get your lunch set up, but it's not that hard to get six colors or to get the rainbow. Right. A tomato, a carrot, a zucchini, or a pepper, and then there's three different colors of peppers, mm -hmm. or a carrot, and there's five different colors of carrots now in some of the organic aisles. So you really can get those multiple colors really quite easily, can't you? Yeah, it's, it's very easy. And then you, you can batch your meals too. That's, that's what's beautiful is that you can prep everything, you can chop everything, take a day to do that, and then you just mix and match and throw it together as the week goes on. Um, you can also do meal delivery, you know, if you can find a local company that will deliver. You can also, that you know, we don't have a lot of this in Arizona, but I know up in the Northwest, they have the farmers um, mm -hmm. deliver foods directly to your doorstep. I don't know if you that's have great. that there. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many little things you can do. Um, so it's a commitment to just, you know, I'm going to do this and, and making those choices for sure. And it doesn't have to be expensive or hard. And no. uh, we um, have a farmer market spring through the fall. It's my favorite place to go every Saturday. 
and they are in most cities, but uh, it doesn't take that much work and it doesn't have to be expensive to be able to eat healthy like that. Absolutely. <laughs> are there uh, rules that you have for your clients to check themselves? Is it monthly in the shower or checking your partner? How, how do you keep self-vigilant, especially yeah. in areas that you can't see? Absolutely. So um, they actually came out with a research article showing that married couples or people that are in a living um, cohabitation relationship mm. um, actually have lower rates of skin cancer because they do check each other. So um, basically, you know, when someone comes in, there's a couple guidelines of what to look for. Um, most people know that if they have a funny looking mole or, um, you know, a spot that is kind of changed, they come in. But some of the other things that they may not realize to look for is a pimple bump that doesn't go away. You think you have a pimple on your face, you know, around the nose or the temple or different areas, and it just doesn't behave like a regular pimple, doesn't go away. So that's something that I definitely recommend just coming in and having evaluated. And then there's rough scaly spots on the skin. I mean, you might get dry skin patches and little things like that, but they should go away with moisturizer over time. If you get one that doesn't go away, that could also be a skin cancer. So in addition to looking for moles and brown spots that change, rough scaly spots that don't go away, and pimple bumps that don't go away. So those are all things that where your skin cell, as it came in, it made a mistake and it created something different than what your normal skin does. You also don't have to be right or wrong about what it is. Um, your dermatologist is going to want to see it and either reassure you or educate you on what it is or say, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you came in. You came in. Let's address this right away um, so we can take care of this and, and you have a minimal scarring or less scarring as if you ignored it. So there's no like wrong answer when you come in. It's, it's either you feel better that, okay, it was healthy. I don't have to worry about it, or I'm so glad I came in because I can get it addressed now. So. Well, you know, one of my favorite things to do is to talk to people smarter than me like you about, <laughs> about uh, client cases. And could I run one by you? Sure, sure. So I had a woman come in today, actually. She's 36, uh, homeschools with three kids. Uh, her husband's a, a high-power CEO, gone a lot, not present mm -hmm. a lot. They've had a recent death in the family, high stress. She's a little what we call type A. She's a very... Um, She's on it. She's one of those super moms who really wants everything perfect in her life, and she works very hard. Mm -hmm. She's conscious about food. Uh, one of her children has a little ADD, uh, not medicated, and she's worried about him. And she comes in at age 35, normal menstrual cycles, and she's developed acne over the last two years. She doesn't mm -hmm. take any supplements. She thinks she might be dairy sensitive. She wonders about gluten because bread makes her bloated. She's never been tested. But she's asking me, what do I do about this acne? Where is it coming from? How should I address it? Do you have kind of a, a framework of how you would approach someone like that? Yeah, so I think definitely picking up on her intuition of some food sensitivities um, yes. are probably key. So the dairy and gluten are something I see a lot. Sugar as well. So I don't know if she even mentioned if she has a sweet tooth or not. Um, but she does, and she, she, gets, <laughs> she gets low blood sugars as well. Oh, yeah. So certainly um, one of the biggest food triggers um, of acne is dairy and sugar and processed foods. So taking an approach of finding out, you know, is that related to her acne or not would be eliminating that for about mm. three weeks to just see, all right, are we sensitive to it? Um, you know, some people can just do one foot at a time. So just eliminate dairy. And dairy is a big category. Some people are surprised by how many foods actually constitute dairy. It's not just milk and cheese. It's your yogurts. It's your sour cream. It's your cottage cheese. It's your cream cheese. It's your coffee cream or sometimes it's your whipped cream you get on your Starbucks mm -hmm. coffee. It also can be your whey protein that you might be thinking is good for you because you're trying to build muscle and be healthy. So that's great, 100%. That, you, that's great that you said that because what she said to me was, Oh, I'm totally dairy free for the last month. Well, what did you have for breakfast? Well, I had my whey protein shake and then I had a Greek yogurt, but that doesn't really count as dairy, right? <laughs> That's a very good point. So you always want to ask people, what, what do you consider dairy? What are you eating? So, you know, dairy is a huge category. There's a lot of misconceptions about it for sure. So. And what do you see is the difference? People will say, I have some dairy and I, I get bloated and crampy and have diarrhea just a short time after. Is that truly dairy sensitivity or is that lactose intolerance and, and how are they different? 
So usually lactose intolerance will not necessarily create a lot of acne. It can create a lot more gut issues. Um, so bloating, flatulence, um, some diarrhea right after. Um, and so some people just do lactate mm -hmm. type of milks and, and things like that. Now those might have more sugar in them. And then we're looking mm -hmm. at a sugar sensitivity type of thing too. So they're like, oh, I have the lactate, I'm fine. But then they find out it's more the sugary thing. So um, the dairy sensitivity is kind of, um, you know, you can do blood tests to see if you're sensitive to dairy. Um, you also can do an elimination diet where you eliminate it. And then you want to be very mindful about how you reintroduce it. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to just reintroduce a whole bunch all at once and, um, you know, a bunch of different types. I've had individuals that are sensitive to milk, but not yogurt or things like that. So trying to, you know, if you really want to get to the bottom, is it a certain type of dairy, you could do that too. So you also want to make sure when you reintroduce, you do it for a couple of days and then you take a break again to see your reaction. Um, and so you don't miss that reaction that you might get that might be delayed. It might be that you just don't think clearly. You're kind of foggy um, before the pimples start breaking out again. So certainly her food sensitivities back to your case would would definitely be you know a trial of elimination of those um and it sounds like there's a stress component there too of you know which i think a lot of us women deal with we're taking care of our kids and everybody else and you're not getting that self-care time that time for yourself and you know so doing you know maybe even a natural skincare ritual where she takes care of her skin you know by herself and and she's doing that she's cleansing and moisturizing and and doing things and hopefully the kids aren't pulling at her leg or you know in the bathroom with her you know <laughs> all of all of those things that can happen i also um I've recommended to some really busy moms like, you know, that are basically chauffeurs and taking their kids everywhere to different things that there's actually time that you can use in the car. Mm -hmm. So um, I recommend some women sometimes will put on a podcast that's Great inspirational idea. to them or Great information idea. and the kids are hearing it too. Yes. Um, also when they're waiting um, for their child to get out of school and they're in that line of cars, um, they can, you know, listen to meditation music while they're in park. Um, they also, before they go to pick up their child, they can sit in the car for a minute and close their eyes before they actually leave the driveway um, when they're alone and just take that minute for themselves. So there's a lot of little moments that you may not realize and they add up, they're cumulative. Um, another little trick is sending little alarms on your phone of just little inspirational messages. So mm -hmm. a lot of phones, you can set a timer of like, you know, set an alarm at, you know, nine o'clock in the morning, and then you have an option to put a text message in there. And you can just put a little inspirational message and just automatically send yourself those throughout the day. You know, maybe it's a reminder to breathe. Maybe it's a reminder, you know, close your eyes for a minute or look outside, look at a tree for a little bit. I mean, there's so many things. Everybody's going to be different, but there's love, moments you could do that. <laughs> I love all these pearls you just shared. And the fact that you know them and can verbalize them and actually teach your clients these, not a lot of doctors are doing that. And it's, it's so, so good to hear. You were talking about sunblock and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about the SPF and uh, mm -hmm. what the number really means, what you should look for. And then the other ingredients that are in cosmetics, beauty products, sunblocks, what are you, what's your advice about SPF and as well as looking at the inactives or other ingredients in, inside of your products? Right. So the SPF is just basically based on sunburn and minutes Ooh. to sunburn. Um, and so basically it's not 100% protective. And, and actually as a community of dermatologists, we recommended that the FDA contacts the companies that make sunscreen and get rid of the word sunblock because it's not really a block, it's a screen. Michelle, so I didn't know that, that the number yeah. is how long, how many minutes it takes till you're burned? So that's what it's based on. I so, have no idea. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's definitely not as blocking as you would think, and it's more about sunburn. It's not, you know, there's still some damage that happens. Um, and so this is where it gets really complicated. You are, are trying to rely on a product to protect you, and you might even be getting misinformation about what it does or doesn't do, um, and so that's where some of the data came out of sunscreen actually creates skin cancer because mm -hmm. it's giving people a false sense of security that they're feeling like they can be out there for a very long time 
and they're protected. And it's, it's honestly just a screen. It's supposed to help with sunburn. It doesn't hundred percent protect you. Um, there's, there's definitely a half life to it where it wears off over time. People aren't reapplying and they actually came out with studies where we found out people aren't even applying enough. Um, some people go have like one uh, big bottle of sunscreen that they've had all summer. I mean, that should last maybe a couple of times outside. So there's all these different caveats to how you're supposed to use it and, and what it's good for. So SPF of between you know, 30 and 50 is what we aim for. There's a debate about whether or not SPF above 50 is okay or not okay as far as protecting and helping. Um, reapplying it is key. Um, most women have a hard time with the reapplication because we get ready in the morning, we apply all of our sunscreen and our makeup and we're good to go and we have SPF in our makeup too, which sometimes isn't enough by the way. You usually need a sunscreen with it. And you're out in the sun all day, you're driving in your car, you're getting the sun's radiation through your car window, and you're not reapplying. And so you say you're wearing sunscreen, but it's, it's breaking down as the day goes on. So one of the little pearls that I recommend to my female patients is to get a powdered sunscreen. And then you just powder throughout the day, um, which you're going to probably powder your makeup anyways, but you might as well have some SPF in it. So I carry those in my car. The other yeah, trick yeah. is when you're driving, the back of your hands are going to get a lot of sun. So using a little sun stick on the back of your hands so you don't get sunscreen on your palms so your steering wheel doesn't get all greasy um, can be very key. Just with the sticks, if you miss a stripe, you miss a stripe. <laughs> so you have to be careful of that. Um, the zinc oxide sunscreens are the ones that I typically recommend. Um, there's a huge debate going on about the other ingredients like avobenzone and oxinolate mm -hmm. and um, all of these other ingredients in their safety. Um, and so this is where it goes back to the foundation of sun protective clothing is above and beyond the best thing. Sunscreen in moderation in just areas where you can't protect. Zinc oxide sunscreens are a little bit um, safer as far as we know now. I'm, it may change. And we're all just doing the best that we can to protect ourselves. So, so those are kind of my quick little pearls. <laughs> what about titanium? Dioxide. Titanium dioxide too would be um, an okay one as well. Um, it sounds bad, but <laughs> it sounds bad, <laughs> um, but it's in a lot of our makeup too. Mm. Um, it's in a lot of the um, natural and organic sunscreens. Um, on the safety profiles of research, it's still been safer than some of the other ingredients. So like the parabens and phthalates. Exactly. And like yeah, yeah, and that's also you know to ask your you know answer your question of all the other you know skincare products. You know, trying to keep them as natural and chemical free as you possibly can. And there's such a huge movement right now in natural skincare products. There's actually so many to choose from. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming for me um, of which ones to use. Um, and so it's the ones where you can recognize the ingredient names, um, that they, they sound kind of plant-based <laughs> for the most part. There's not, you know, some chemicals, you know, in it that you're just like, it's all chemicals. Um, most of my patients, they're really surprised when they bring in their products and then we actually turn them together to look at the ingredients of what's in it yes. and go through them. Um, there's also a lot of allergens and a lot of skincare products and people may not recognize that. And if you don't have sensitive skin, you know, it's probably okay. But I've had people that are sensitive to lavender, sensitive mm -hmm. to shea and some of the botanicals, which is kind of hard, but, but yeah, that's kind of the quick version of, of the products too. <laughs> so, so Dr. Jeffries, what's this whole vitamin D myth that's going around? <laughs> Oh, there's so much to vitamin D. So much controversy oh, about vitamin D. We could probably spend the whole like day talking about all so of it. So do you check it in all your patients? What gold do you use it for? How do you like to replenish it? Yeah, and is it I as do. as important as we think it is? Yeah, it's so good of a question. All of these things are coming up. Um, and so I do check it. I do see a lot of um, inflammatory skin diseases like vitiligo, psoriasis, um, things like that. Even my skin cancer patients to um, tend to be low. I do aim for an optimum range of 40 to 60. Um, uh, we definitely have a huge population of patients here that get a lot of sun exposure, come in with very tan skin and their vitamin D is bottomed out. And so there is something called your vitamin D receptor in your skin. And we can have genetic um, kind of abnormalities of that that we were just born with where we're not processing the vitamin D on our skin and transverting it into um, the hormone that we need yes, internally. I have that. I Me too. <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah. And it surprised me because my vitamin D levels were great. Uh, yeah. And now uh, it makes me want to rethink what level I need to do and how often. So I take it every day, even though I live here. 
Right, right. And I do too as well. Um, and so it's, you can, do, you probably eat healthy and probably get your vitamin D through a lot of foods as well and through supplements. Um, there is a debate now of, you know, there's a lot of information that came out several years ago that vitamin D was related to everything under the sun, you know, and, and um, now we're finding out maybe, maybe it's not. Um, but I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, and especially in medicine, and, and this is probably good for anybody watching this, is that when you hear about a trend and it's a cure-all for everything, just have a little grain of salt that it may not be. Well, that's great. I, I think, you know, vitamin D and, and like a lot of things, I'm sure uh, your clients do the same thing I do. They go to Dr. Google, they read things in the paper, and the media only does the one little snip that they want to try to promote that gets all the headlines and highlights. They don't really look at the data. And, and so many of these studies are hard for even us to try right. to sort out. Um, right. um, do you have kind of rules that you use for your clients about um, sources of information they should go to or sources they should avoid? You know, I mean, Dr. Google is usually where they end up. Um, it's it's hard to discourage them <laughs> and anybody to go there. there. There's just so much information there. Um, I really just prefer that they come in and ask and, yeah. and just get their levels checked and us have an individualized discussion about where their vitamin D is at. Is it related to their skin issue that they're coming in for? Um, I feel like it's just one component of a health issue um, I feel like if we looked at other inflammatory markers or other hormones, we might find that there's other things related to. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that you can look at vitamin D in isolation. Um, I feel like it really has to be in context. Um, so, you know, there, there may be sites out there that aren't as good as others or as good of a resource, but just bring them to your trusted physician and go over the information. Um, and it would be a physician that's willing to take the time to look at those things and go over them with you and, and take the time to talk to you about those. Sometimes you may not get to everything else that you needed to in that visit because that is more of a priority at that moment. But it's really important that you're able to get the information that's best for you rather than what you read and rather what, what the media is promoting and kind mm -hmm. of really find out um, how it impacts you as an individual. Well, you know, I think one of the things of the kind of medicine you and I do is that we're very thorough we're, mm -hmm. we're complete. We turn over every stone. And, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, as an internist, dermatology, and when I find these unique skin issues, lesions, or other things, they're difficult for me. And I think there's a lot of misinformation about skin out there. Can I just ask you if you have off the top of your head, what are some of the myths about skin health that you see in your clinic or people come and think is true that really isn't true? Hmm. Let me think about that. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. It's a tough question. Yeah. I mean, I would say, you know, the things we just talked about, about skin cancer, sun exposure, vitamin D, that's a discussion I hold every day um, with multiple patients. And so, you know, the vitamin D um, that I need enough, I need to be out there all the time. I'm going to get enough through that. That's one of the biggest myths that I see that, you know, it just depends. It depends on, on everybody. Um, one of the other things I run into sometimes with my acne patients is the whole issue about coconut oil and using mm. coconut oil on their skin. So I see actually a lot of flare-ups of acne of coconut oil used on the face versus on the body. The body, it tends to be a great moisturizer, but we have so many oil glands on the face. Um, it tends to be just not the right consistency for if you're prone to acne breakouts. Um, one of the other um, things, I have a lot of women that come in for anti-aging treatments um, as far as like what skincare products can I use on my skin to just help me, you know, stay looking the way I am or preserve or, you know, do things. And a lot of women are using vitamin C serums, which are absolutely wonderful. But my subpopulation of patients that tend to break out, they actually mm -hmm. can make you break out a little bit. So that's one of the things where they may be using a product and think it's fine. And then they're actually breaking out from it. Um, so those are kind of be the top things I could think of in the top of my head. Do you have any that you run into as well or? Well, I, I think a lot of what you mentioned, I was just thinking to myself how probably the most money misspent in medicine is on diets and weight loss. And probably the second might be to be treating acne. Yes. There's so many things <laughs> out there. Oh, and you yeah. see them at the mall, you see them on the internet, you see our clients bring them in, you see our kids using them. It's hard and it's hard for me as a physician. So I could just, I really empathize with all of our viewers who are dealing with acne and skin conditions like that. It's really hard. Yeah. If you're, if you're lucky enough to have someone like Dr. Jeffries in your community, go see them. Find someone who can do this whole person approach, an integrative approach, a functional root cause approach. 
Um, Michelle, if people wanted to, to reach out and find you to learn more about you and the work that you're doing, how do they find you? How do they connect with you? You know, the best way is on my website. Um, I have a website. It's my name. It's drmichellejeffries.com. Um, it's M-I-C-H-E, two L's, L-L-E. And then my last name is spelled J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S. My website is based on being beautiful inside and out. And I take a mind, body, spirit, um, and, and, and skin um, care approach. And so it's blending all of those together. And so I have a welcome kit that you can um, download for free. And it'll talk about some of these pearls of different foods to help with your body, to nourish from the inside out, some mindfulness practices to help with your mind, um, some spiritual guidance to help connect with spirit, um, and then skincare products as well. So um, it's a great resource. It's free. Um, you can sign up for that. Um, I am on Facebook and Instagram. Um, Dr. Michelle Jeffries is my Instagram. Um, and then just my name, Michelle Jeffries, and Integrative Dermatologist are my two uh, Facebook pages. But I think you get the most resources out of the website. Well, I'm going to go get that welcome package right now. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. <laughs> and the fact you have a degree in psychology and are a physician and a dermatologist, triple board certified, I think you bring a unique skill set to everyone, your clients. And, and thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much. It was an honor to be here. <laughs>